So what Mauricio told us is very exciting. And um, there's a group of us that have been working on environmental flows for more than a decade. And we've done a lot of work. And, and in my view, they wouldn't have had um, uh, been able to take such strong uh, response to that opportunity without some of the work that we've done. And I'm going to present some of that today. So what I'm hoping to get out of my presentation is understanding why we need environmental flows and what we want those environmental flows to do, at least from the physical side. We'll have um, one of the fish biologists up later, and he'll talk more about biology, but I'm going to talk about the physical side. There are a lot of partners, primarily Utah State University, um, USGS Office of Flagstaff in Austin, um, the National Park Service has put a lot of funding into this, and then the local university, Solar Rock State, has been very helpful as well. Um, historical photos provide a basis for evaluating change. The Hill Expedition in 1899 <clears throat> took a lot of photos along the river. So we can take some of those photos, other groups of photos, go out and look for those places and take another picture and see what's different. You see on the top there is 1909. This is in, um, um, at the top of the Hot Springs Canyon in the park looking towards Langford Hot Springs and the Tor and Tornado Creek coming in from the right. Uh, so this is looking upstream. And then the second picture, 2008, um, same stretch of river. It's very different. You can see that um, in the top picture, there's very little riparian vegetation. I can't see any in that picture. Um, that was the state of the river when it flashed and, and flooded in here. Without, um, and, and so now we've got change. We can see heavily, heavily vegetated gravel bars, um, and most of that vegetation is invasive. An African grass um, called the Rhododonax, salt cedar, a little bit less of a problem now, but um, but what's taking its place in a lot of instances is um, the Athol, um, another salt cedar tree or, or, or tamarisk tree. That's the big green tree that looks like a Christmas tree in the lower left. Why is that going on? Um, we can start by looking at stream gauging data to sort of give us an idea of, of, of why that might happen. What we're looking at here is pre-dam um, hydrographs, annual hydrographs for the Rio Grande at two different locations. The black line is for above, um, um, excuse me, the black line is for downstream of Presidio and the red line is for upstream of Presidio. So the red line tells us what's coming out of the northern branch out of New Mexico, basically. And the black line is telling us what's coming out of um, uh, Chihuahua and Durango. So we can see that the red line, it's classic snow melt peak. Spring comes, snow melts, and the rivers come up. Um, there we see that um, um, some of that possibly out of, out of, of um, Mexico, but it's driven by monsoon season. So unlike most of the rivers in the west, the peak and flow for the Rio Grande below Presidio comes in the monsoon season. That is the natural peak. Um, since the, that they said we've had 100 years of river regulation. Both these dams were established in 1916. La Boquilla, which is near uh, Chihuahua in Chihuahua, Mexico, and then Elephant Bee near Truth of Consequences, New Mexico. Um, with 100 years of regulation, we can look at what has that done to the flows at different locations. So what we've got here are three different data sets. We've got the original on the, on the left, the pre-disturbance -pre or pre-damming um, uh, uh, water data. And the thickness of those lines tells you how much water is in there. So the thicker the line, there's more water. So you can see coming out of Colorado, going through Mexico, it gets progressively smaller and smaller. And then when the conchos comes in, um, that pointer. But uh, the conscious is coming in from the lower left, big fat line, and it's uh, more water than was in the Rio Grande. That's the pre disturbance um, hydrologic context. From 1932 to 1940, you can see the lines get smaller, and then the last set there is 1995 to 2005. So that's one of the cha changes that we can see. Besides just looking at the pictures, we can see that the, the water is disappearing. What does it mean for a river to take away the water? Um, the two pictures I have here are the most upstream dams. Um, the one on the lower left is um, Luis Leon. It's in, uh, downstream the last um, major irrigation center in Mexico. Um, 
it's two, almost 200 miles, 108 miles upstream. And then the next one on the right there is Caballo, which is below Elephant Butte. I'm guessing it's more than 300 miles upstream. That was, I did a quick calculation on that. Um, in between, the country looks like this. So we've moved the water, and then we've got 200 miles of um, desert watersheds that are, are pretty much denuded and exporting a lot of sediment. So what that means is we have more sediment than water. And this, this is a, uh, a pretty famous little figure here to, to help you understand exactly what happens. If you take away the water, the right side's going to rise, and you can see that means ag aggregation. So essentially, when the sediment comes in from the tributaries like Terlingua Creek or Tornillo um, or even Alamito, there's no water there to carry it downstream, so it's filling in the channel. This is what, um, what we're seeing as channel aggregation. So, in the early 2000s, we really didn't understand what that meant. We didn't know uh, when the changes happened, we didn't know how fast, we didn't know the, the relationship between those changes and the flow, or um, uh, where, where the changes we couldn't see. So we dug a trench, a giant trench near Rio Grande Village, you can see the red line there in the, in the upper left map shows um, where that trench was. And then um, we dug up the salt cedars that were in that sediment as well. So we used sedimentology. We looked at all the different layers of sediments, sand, fine sand, sand coarse sand, to silt, clay. And we used tree ring analysis to tell us um, how fast that channel filled in. So the bottom figure there, um, is a cross section of that trench, and you can see all the different layers. And that sort of pink layer in the middle is the original surface prior to infilling. Um, and then 93 to 96, we lost almost half the, the width. Um, so, and then successive um, packages over there with dates that we can assign. And that's, that's done with the tree rings from the salt cedar, which is uh, the upper right. Doesn't seem to be there. We go. Okay, let's go back to a picture real quick and see what that means. If we're going to fill in the channel, what does that mean um, for the critters that live there? On the upper left, you can see um, the upper photo. You can see a big open sandbar on the left. You can see an eddy on the right. Another sandbar upstream, um, and now those are covered with vegetation. Those eddies, those sandbars, those are all habitat. So that those those habitats are no longer available for whatever critter you're interested in, whether it's a diatom at the bottom of the food chain or a big fish at the top of the food chain. Um, the other thing to think about, and something that we need to work on, is those sediments um, are filters for the river, and when you start covering them up and narrowing the channel, there's less of that filter filtration going on, so there's possibly some issues with water quality there. I'm not going to get into water quality today, that's another presentation, but um, I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards if you like. Um, we can also do some total traffic surveying to, to help us understand. Um, the Park Service is now monitoring about 66 cross sections, um, and then uh, with, with USGS out of Flagstaff, as well as six or seven beaches downstream of Opeas Canyon. Sol Ross is involved with that. That's, that's a, a fairly large partnership. What that topographic data can show us is, is we can look at the changes in, in the um, river cross section. So the top um, graph there, the bottom black line, is one of our earliest topographic surveys. And then as you can see through time, that left bank rises, and the cross-sectional area gets smaller and smaller. So think about the pipes in your house when they get clogged, or your arteries when they get clogged. That's what basically happened to the river, it's getting compressed. So velocities go up, it's, it's um, all sorts of problems there. The, the next one in the middle, you can see on the right, that's a back channel, that's a backwater, that's a place where um, young fish are reared, and you can see that it's filled in. The bottom graph, this is the hopeful part of this picture, as you can see that the black is the original, and then the red is, is the successive survey. So what that told us was that a long duration dam release out of Luis Leon, out of Mexico, can scour, can evacuate sediment. And 
you, that, that was without thinking about environment flows. That was just a flow that they did. All right, continuous sediment monitoring and suspended sediment. In this the next couple slides, we're going to get a little technical and geeky. I apologize for that, but these are important um, instruments. In two locations within the park, the USGS had a flagstaff installed some sensors in the river that can actually measure the amount of floating sediment going by. Um, it's acoustic Doppler technology. They're paired with some uh, streams um, sampling we're doing as well. So we're trying to figure out the sediment budget. Um, these are also paired with um, two other stations that are run by the uh, Texas Water Science Center, USGS office in Austin, paid for um, by TCEQ um, to measure water quality and water discharge. Those um, you can find those sites online if you're interested. But um, so there's two different sets of continuous monitoring there that are very important to our work. So this slide here um, shows uh, that elevation, basically, the, the, me, it shows sediment stored in particular reefs. We can use those sensors and our uh, cross sections, put those together, and we can actually ca calculate how much sediment is stored within a reach, how much of it is evacuated here in a particular flow, or how much it increases during a particular flow. Um, and again, this tells us that regular dam releases can move sediment. 2008, um, how many of you were here in 2008? Uh, so one of the things we have learned um, through all this analysis is that um, Big hurricanes that come out of, of the Pacific or even the Gulf um, and park over in northern Chihuahua, West Texas, are big drivers in um, the geomorphology and the shape of the river. Um, so 2008, we had one of those, and that's the picture on the right. This is um, looking downstream at the, the Rio Conchos coming in from the right, and the Rio Grande downstream, again, um, in the distance. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the levee there in the center of the picture um, is keeping the water from flooding the town of Presidio. However, the riparian arm for all that clear water is rising up underneath it. Right? Um, and the reason that flow got so high and there was so much damage was because of those pictures I showed earlier where the channel gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So when the water does come, there's no place for it. So it rises, it moves into the, to the towns and uh, places that doesn't normally go. The photo set on the left there is um, Bokeas Canyon entrance bar. Um, the top photo is, I think, two, uh, can we, 55, I think. Um, the middle one is 2008, and the bottom one is, um, excuse me, 2005, and the bottom one is 2008. So you can see in the top, the gravel bar has very little vegetation on it. Um, the gravel bar on the other side of Mexico with very little vegetation on it. And then by 2005, it's, everything is completely vegetated. Um, if you look closely, you can see some black in there and some dead trees. This is right at the beginning of our efforts to control some of the aquatic vegetation. So we lit it on fire and then came back and sprayed the leaf sprouts with herbicide, trying to um, get rid of the invasive and exotic vegetation and hope that natives um, would replace it. Um, and that seemed to be working. And then 2008 came along and washed it all the way in. Um, so the point here is flows of the driver. We can do a lot of um, things along the banks to make it nicer, um, but really flows are, are, the, are, the, are the big force. Um, I'm not talking about water quality, I just wanted to throw in one slide. Um, salinity is increasing in the Big Bend Ridge. Um, the, both of these are, one's near Presidio, I believe, the other one's in Santa Elena, I think, yes. Um, so uh, TDS, or measured salinity, is going up through time. That other bottom right picture is um, data from the Texas Clean Rivers Program, which the International Body of Water Commission um, works, uh, administers on the Rio Grande. Um, and there's chloride and sulfate data in there. And one of the, the reason I put this in is I want to make a plug for continuous monitoring. Um, 
the Texas Clean Rivers program, we were measure, measuring or sampling eight times a year, um, which is fantastic. However, there's a month in there that you're not catching stuff. And if there's a spill or some sort of contaminant, or um, you're just not going to catch it. And one of the um, crazy things is you can see that the, um, both chloride and sulfate are going up through time. And then that red and blue bump in there the last month was just out of this world. I'm guessing it came back down. I'm guessing that was some sort of pretty little salty water package that maybe came from one of the oil um, and gas exploration operations in Okinawa. Uh, there was a newspaper reports at this time that there was 30 rigs drilling in Okinawa. So um, that might be what that is, um, illustrates. But the point is, if we hadn't been there that day, at that moment, if we had waited two days, we might have missed it. So that's the my plug for the team this morning. What we know about um, environmental flows. Tributary flows during monsoon season accumulate sediment in the channel. So all these um, flashes um, that come down the creeks in monsoon season pick up a bunch of sediment and dump it in the river. And that goes on to the side, that fills the back channels um, and narrows the channel. Um, sediment accumulation harms aquatic habitat um, and the ability of the river to filtrate water, uh, filtrate or clean the water. Long duration dam releases can erode and do hike with sediment. Uh, water quality is more related, and then many species of riparian plants and animals are timed for spring runoff. Um, so it's, that is probably something we should think about in our environment for us. We can't just be thinking about moving sediment in monsoon season, but we need to think about what are the um, requirements for um, whatever fish we have left. This is a, I think this is my last slide. Um, this is a conceptual model that came from Dave Dean and Jack Schmidt. Um, and what this represents is, you can see that the top line there is um, channel width. And you can see prior to um, uh, damming, it, it sort of fluctuated back and forth. And then that line there just left in the middle is the first dams. You can see that that began to narrow, and then we'd have a um, hurricane, it'd be a little wider, narrow some more, hurricane, it's a little wider, narrow some more, and another hurricane. Um, and then the bottom line there is uh, relative vegetation density. So without all that, those big floods coming through every year, the riparian um, the vegetation is increased. Um, so if we don't do anything, you know, this is this is where we're at. It's just going to get narrower, and we're, we're going to have more floods and, and uh, more choked off banks and less native uh, fish and invertebrates. And that's it. So our next presenter is going to be Ryan Smith. He works for the Nature Conservancy, and uh, a brief. Uh, Detailed on Ryan is that he actually works out of San Antonio and a lot of his focus is on the management of tributaries. So we're going to hear a little bit more detail on rivers like the Devils and the Pecos River. So thank you, Ryan. Come on up. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come and uh, talk with you all today. Um, like Jeff said, I'm going to I'm going to try and fill in um, with some other perspectives on environmental flows in the basin. And like, like uh, I said, I, I do a lot of my work now in the Devils and the Pecos River, but I've got some experience throughout the basin, so I'm going to try and fill in um, with a bit of details about how we think about the, the ecological side of environmental flows and give a couple of examples of how we worked on things, both basin-wide and in the Devils, and just think about how we, can, how we, could, we could use this throughout the rest of the basin um, as we try and think about what our vision for flows in, in the basin is. And um, thank you, Jeff, for your, your talk, because um, I was able to take out about five slides and just slip this one in right here. Um, just not needing so much to set the stage for for the state of things in, in, the, in the Rio Grande Basin um, and talk about um, the impacts. But um, this was with my own picture that I took in 2008 after that that uh, flood event and um, what I wanted to just sort of put this up here to begin with because you can, you can see a lot in this in terms of 
um, the different functions of all aspects of the flow regime that are important for maintaining all aspects of the river ecosystem. And Jeff talked about how we need to put, we need those high flow events to, to structure the overall habitat. And this looks a little bit more like the old than it did, but but not quite totally a, a resetting flow. Um, but when I look at this, I think it's interesting because um, it shows kind of what we have to work with. Like actually, like Jeff said towards there at the end, um, the the changes to the to the regime have given us sort of a different playing field um, when we think about the ecology and what happens inside the channel after these events. And this this event put things back in as far as sunstream habitats to a degree, but but not not back where they were in a way that supports the full range of native species. So a lot of what we're trying to do with environmental flows is understand these functions in a little bit more detail and think about how we can balance the human needs for water, but also try and put back as much of the function as we possibly can with what, with what we have left. Um, so I'm going to start with, with a slide with way too, way too many words on it that no one probably except me can read, but um, I wanted to, as we think about all the functions of, of a flow regime, because we all know that the river is not a constant flow. It's, it's uh, variable and has different functions that we can describe. Um, we, uh, we did some work compiling a lot of the information in 2011 on the Senate Bill 3 environmental flows process and the BVEST report. And um, to get a snapshot of all the functions of all these flows, kind of this, the way this table is structured is from top to bottom and goes from real low flows all the way down to those channel resetting events. And and it's laying out the functions of all those flows for the geomorphological realm, for ecology, and also for water quality. So there's no way that Jeff and I, um, or the speakers, could talk about all these today. We talked about the lower end of this table. I'm going to talk about the ecology, but if you want to see um, the, the full range, um, get a hold of that report and look through some more of the, the functions. So the main thing I want to talk about um, primarily today <coughs> is related to, to habitat and talking about um, fish primarily. And um, one of the important aspects about the ecology of the natural river is the variability of habitats and what that means for the types of, of species and things that we see when we're out there on the river. Um, and because the alterations to the river have changed that physical template like Jeff was describing, um, narrowed the channel, eliminated a lot of habitat types. Um, one of the things we need to understand, if we want to understand how to put back some of that function, is how these fishes depend on those, those habitats, both the ones that are still there and the ones that are, that are gone. So we, we see sort of on the left, more shallow, um, fast-moving riffle habitats or sandy shoals in some of the alluvial reaches of, of the Rio Grande. On the left side, deeper pools, and each of these have a different suite of species. Not only fishes, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about fish because that's that's my area. But this goes all the way from the from the trees up on the bank all the way down to to algae and diatoms. Um, and there's different things that live in different areas. So we need to understand how we how this variability is affected by changes in flows if we want to be able to think about how far we can put back the ecological function. So I'm going to talk about a couple of tools that we used to to, um, to do that. And um, one that we used in that the Senate Bill 3 process and also was used throughout Texas by the Extreme Flows program is to think about the habitats. Um, we can we can know a lot about the the fish preferences for habitats, um, and that's kind of what's shown here mathematically, trying to basically put put a quantitative number on do they like fat? Do they like fast, shallow riffles? Um, do they like uh, low temperatures? Things like that. And we can quantify that. Um, then we can go and map. We can actually create maps of the river. Either actually through things like LIDAR or other tools actually create a bathymetric map of the river and then use hydraulic modeling to determine what conditions look like at different flow levels and then take that information on what fish want and we can actually figure out if this river stays at 10 CFS for an extended period of time, what is that going to mean for these fish that, that want this kind of habitat or that kind of habitat? 
Um, and that allows us to, to really understand a little bit better for, to, to know what, uh, what we can do with what we've got left. And we can draw maps like, or draw graphs like this, which is basically showing on the, on the y-axis, it's showing uh, amount of flow, flow, flow discharge. This is from Devil's River, for example. Um, and then the graphs are showing how the amount of habitat for different species of fish changes across flow. And this is showing something like eight or ten different species. But we can do this for um, for different species. We can do it for um, different gills of species and things like that. <clears throat> and then what we what this allows us to do is to think about if we're if we're driving this river from say 100 cfs, which is about in the middle of that that uh, range, um, down to more frequent flows around 20 25 cfs. We can get a pretty clear picture that we're reducing the amount of habitat for key species by by quite a amount. Or if we're already down at that lower level, this helps us kind of develop a target for where we need to get back up to in order to create those those habitat types. Um, so this is this is a method we can use to the Devils River and the Pecos River um, to some degree. Um, the type of this method was used by USGS Water Science Center and in the Big Bend Reach, but this might be something to think about um, as we continue to try and understand how to work with what we still have in the, the Big Bend Reach. Um, another, another approach is to not talk about quantifying habitat, but go to the actual fish themselves, or, or the mussels, or whatever, and actually relay, uh, relate to measures of the fish, like population size, or uh, diversity of fish, or things like that and actually relate those measures to measures of flow itself. Um, like different flow metrics, like number of zero flow days in, in a year, or average flow in June, if we know that June is a particularly important month. And this allows us to get it different, um, different, a little bit more refined perspective on different parts of the flow regime that are particularly important, and how that relates to, to biology. And we can build you can't see these graphs very really well, but can basically build a relationship between the degree of change in important flow components and what we would expect in terms of population size of fishes or diversity of fish. And again, we can we can then evaluate how much change we're willing to willing to accept and where we want to get back to, and that gives us a target for, for flow restoration. And this is something we're working on the Devil's River right now. Um, some of the outputs that can come from this, uh, this is from some work in actually in the Great Plains, but can be some pretty sophisticated modeling approaches that allow us to, to use even a pretty low amount of data. And you can, you can find out from this what are the important flow metrics and also sort of what are target or threshold ranges of those, those flow metrics that, that we really need to try and work toward. Um, in the Big Bang, I'm going to try and go through some of these a little more quickly, but Big Bang, some of these methods have not been applied a lot, but the groundwork is really there. And um, on the left side, there's, there's been a lot of work done over the years understanding the changes in the fish community and how we've gotten to where we are. And then more recently, um, um, in favor of Booty Shop, um, doing some work really showing that what's really important in terms of what's left for habitats, the more complex areas with a variety of habitat types is where the diversity of fishes is still occurring. And a lot of that is in the non alluvial reaches. Um, but we could use that as input to some of these other types of methods if we want to, want to look at a little more uh, precise way as far as what, what target levels for base flows might be through, through those reaches. I um, just want to say really quickly, I'm not going to talk much about this in short on time, but um, we talked about fish, we can also use this approach with other taxonomic groups. This is the Texas horn shell mussel, uh, recently federally listed as endangered. And um, uh, some researchers, Dr. Rankley at Texas A&M, are using a different modeling approach, occupancy modeling, to look at which reaches of the river particularly of interest are lower canyons and then the reach between the and side of Falcon. But uh, which reaches could be really suitable habitat if flows are maintained that would maintain the water quality that, that those muscles need. Um, so we can, we can do the same thing 
for for other tags and not just not just fishes. Um, and one other thing I really want I really wanted to highlight too is as Jeff alluded to, you know, one of the key things that's maintaining what we still have, and in the case of the Devil's River, maintaining it in a very natural state, is our our aquifers and their contributions to the rivers, which we're going to hear from Dr. Benzie on a little later. Um, but when we got these places where the like the in this case the Elvis Trinity Aquifer is creating the Devil's River through spring flow, and then that creates the ecological template. Um, if we use this science to understand what's needed by by the fishes, we can actually back that through this process and use it not only when talking about um, surface water use, but we could actually back it up into the groundwater management targets. Um, so we've been working on not only trying to understand what the, the fish need and what the mussels need, but to develop the science to understand the groundwater surface water connections to where we can actually take that <clears throat> Excuse me. All the way back and use it as groundwater management targets, at least in our joint planning process, but also maybe at the at the groundwater district level, similar to what the Edwards Aquifer Authority has, has done. Um, so I'm going to just uh, skip here really quick, and um, the, the one just real quick point I wanted to make. We don't have much time to talk about this too much, but. Um, is we can we can use the ecology not only to understand uh, what we've got and how we've gotten to to um, to this state with all these dramatic changes, but we can also use it as a more refined way to think about how we want to put things back. And we've already done that in, in terms of informing the environmental flow uh, standards through Senate Three, which theoretically provides some protection for environmental flows, at least in future water rights currently, um, but that, that doesn't get us very far, it doesn't help us even maintain much, but we can use these, these types of things to also inform restoration strategies, um, like water rights transactions, um, water markets potentially, uh, water use efficiencies, and, and very importantly, dam operations in certain places where dam operations are affecting it. Um, we can use this in a, in a way to inform those. And there's some tools being developed right now on the Texas side by Parks and Wildlife to where there's actually going to be an online tool that can support decision making on that um, called the Environmental Flows Information Toolkit. So if you want to hear more about these things, catch me later um, or ask questions during the discussion and um, I will stop there. Uh, located out of Laredo, Texas, down in the lower basin of the Rio Grande Rio Bravo, and he's uh, representing Rio Grande International Study Center. So, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Nuestros amigos, hermanos y hermanas de México, bienvenidos. Quick note: I want to, you know, applaud the people of the Big Bend region for taking ownership of the region, the river, and the landscape. I really hope I take that energy back home with me, you know, to the people of Laredo, Texas, and the region. Um, it's just something that we really need, you know, to focus on moving forward for not only the health of the people currently there, but future generations. I am currently representing the Rio Grande International Study Center. Um, Trisha couldn't make it, so she really apologizes, but I hope, again, her energy, you know, comes through with the, you know, continuing slides and whatnot. So, who we are, uh, established in 1994 by an energetic, um, very motivated few that, you know, whose simple goal was to kind of be a watchdog for the Rio Grande and, you know, environmental conditions of the region, which were severely impacted by industry, by, you know, rampant development, um, pollution on both sides of the border, and that is just, you know, something that has been an ongoing battle. Um, advocacy on behalf of the river, um, we consider ourselves um, of the region our the one and lone voice for the Rio Grande in that you know middle reach or stretch of the river. Um, and education and informing the community. One of the biggest issues that we face is you know apathy, 
Um, one of the another big issue is, is people saying, "Well, what does my effort? I am only one person, um, and how am I going to contribute to something as a big problem of the Rio Grande?" Um, little do they understand the collective, you know, group can can you know make miracles, especially when we're dealing with you know issues of the environment, you know, you know, government, and all of these things moving forward. Um, the pillars of how we, you know, establish risk moving forward. Um, river health is first and foremost top priority. Green space preservation. A lot of the, you know, community where we're from, Laredo, Texas, in the region, green spaces, you know, don't exist. And the little green spaces that we do have are artificial landscapes. For some reason, in the South Texas region, we always see San Antonio as a model. San Antonio is a totally different landscape compared to Laredo, Texas. Different trees, different moisture regime, and that's something that we need to understand and embrace our natural flora and fauna. Um, and that's something that you know we're trying to, to kind of push forward in our community, especially with uh, you know the mayor and a lot of the you know local government fundraisers and grants. Um, discussing climate change impacts because as we know that Laredo is one of the largest inland ports um, and climate change is very real especially for the vehicular traffic, truck traffic and a lot of these things that are impacting our area. Community engagement, I'm not going to go through these verbatim but you know there are lots of things that we have to kind of gather our community and, and you know kind of engage people and make them aware of the precious natural resources that we have, um, plants, animals, you know, the importance of river and water health that, you know, sustains life in our small little stretch of, of the world. Um, one of the things that, you know, I really get up and look forward to is anytime I can get out on the river, you know, it's just one of those wonderful things and it kind of, every time you go out and you paddle the stretch of the Rio Grande, no matter where you are, it kind of, you know, rekindles you and, and lights that fire again to kind of keep the work going. Um, risk top priority, the Rio Grande watershed. Um, I know a lot of data has been thrown around and also depending on which text you consult, there's different, you know, I guess, um, information on how long it stretches, the watershed and the basin. Um, you know, just giving you the idea, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas, and that's our stretch of the Rio Grande. Um, five Mexican states of Durango, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Tamaulipas. And these all impact that one water source that gives life to this area. Um, Rio Grande still ranks as one of the ten most at-risk rivers or endangered rivers in the world. Over-extraction, as I mentioned before in Jeff's talk. Um, insufficient water supply um, due to over-extraction, you know, increased management, and also pollution on both sides of the border. Why do we protect it? It's our only water source. It creates that vital habitat for a water source of many species that are endemic to this region. Big Bend is no different. Um, Laredo, Texas is no different. The Lower Rio Grande Valley is no different. Um, so what are the problems that we are currently facing in our basin? Uh, rock sewage discharges. Um, we are wanting to solidify and rekindle our partnership with our Mexican brothers and sisters and to make sure that this no longer happens because it stresses the environment, it stresses, you know, the environmental health and inflows and all of these things that we're all discussing, but it endangers quality of life for millions of people along its border. Rampant urban development, this is an ongoing issue, and I'll touch on homeland security in a little bit, but, you know, development along the border is, you know, pristine and prime habitat. A lot of the private lands of ranchers cannot, you know, market it for hunting or for, you know, fishing or have it any other way. They're going to sell it to a developer, you know, at a high cost and they're going to build on it. And our stretch of the river, there aren't any expanses like you have in the Big Bend from the river at 100 miles inland. We have a very narrow riparian corridor that's incredibly sensitive to disturbance. Um, homeland security, this is an ongoing battle. A lot of the things that occur in our stretch of the river in our region are largely dependent on their, you know, resources and what they have. They have the purse, right? We have the voice. So if we kind of go on our daily life without 
you know, asking those questions and wondering why are they doing what they're doing, then, you know, who knows what's going to happen? How is our landscape going to be irreversibly changed? So, what we want to do is, you know, increase our monitoring infrastructure, um, you know, water quality, you know, testing at regular intervals, continuous monitoring, as Jeff mentioned, um, looking at, you know, emerging contaminants, microplastics, and these are all things that are not currently being monitored at our stretch of the river. And I'd like to see that moving forward, and I'm sure we all like to see that moving forward. So poor river water quality, again, roughly five to six million gallons of raw sewage, you know, since 2011, as we mentioned, have been discharged into the river by, you know, Nuevo Laredo and other, you know, sewage outfalls for in in lack of infrastructure or for whatever reason. And this is something that we're going to work closely and we're working closely with them to kind of handle this problem moving forward. Um, some data, you know, this is Dr. Tom Bond conducting his clean, clean rivers water monitoring along our stretch. And, you know, this graphic is just kind of giving you the idea of the spikes that can result of, you know, water, raw sewage outfalls, and, you know, monitoring can catch these things where we have our fecal coliform and E. coli bacteria levels are through the roof at that one station. Another view, you know, here we have Laredo, Texas, no Laredo, and the Rio Grande as it kind of snakes through here, that one station, again, picking up fecal coliform and E. coli levels that are through the roof. National emergency. February 15, 2019, we all remember this day, right? And it's declaration on, you know, the impacts of our river. Um, president declared national emergency, again, called for funding for a border wall that would stretch along the U.S.-Mexico border. And what are the impacts and how we're going to discuss that moving forward. The river, again, the U.S.-Mexico border is approximately 1,954 miles long, um, and it forms about 100. 1,240 miles that border this land between the U.S. and Mexico. So this was taken in 2018, and this is the fallout. Our brave men and women were dispatched to the border to kind of, you know, seal it off and, and, and protect, you know, us from a non-existent emergency in that respect. And here you have, you know, Humvees stuck in the mud, you know, landscape that is being torn up, and you have barbed wire that is all along the border, especially in some of my study sites, it's really annoying. But, you know, these are the kind of things that, you know, happen when, you know, government is involved closely with, you know, natural resources along the river. A looming crisis. What happens, what will happen if a wall is erected along the stretch of the Rio Grande that borders U.S. and Mexico? Sensitive ecosystems, now repairing corridors gone, fragmented habitats, you know, the, you know, the facilitation and spread of invasive species, catastrophic flooding, now you don't have that buffer zone of vegetation that will, you know, decrease the energy of flows and flooding events like we saw in 2010, and again, dividing human communities and tribal nations along its border. Um, what's at stake moving forward? Six national parks and monuments, seven national wildlife refuges, 4.3 million acres of wilderness, and 15 million people will be affected. Um, kind of going through these slides, reiterating the fact that our watershed and the basin, you know, there is a zone here that will be impacted by the, by the actual building of the wall, and not only right at the water's edge, but inland as well. So you're talking vehicular traffic, construction, and, you know, other unknown damages that will occur. Walls are absurd, right? Tall enough ladder will get you through it. Or this, right? Ingenuity. Or you can climb it for a nice photo op. And, you know, things like this, like the national emergency has yielded new opportunities. The new Laredo Coalition, which launched a new campaign, Where is the Emergency? And currently we are in a lawsuit filed on behalf of Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., of risk, earth justice, and, you know, kind of putting a halt on building of the wall. So this is my stuff, and again, Trisha's energy kind of flowed through me today, 
and just kind of going along, um, looking at ecological restoration practices along the Rio Grande. Um, I have, you know, been working along this stretch of the river since 2007. Um, it started along with um, Dr. John Goolsby and the phone call I got and working on, you know, but release of biological um, control agents for the Arundo Donax and Giant Reef, um, kind of reiterating the fact that the riparian corridor along this area is incredibly narrow. Many endemic, you know, plants and animals exist here. Um, again, disturbances make these areas susceptible to exotic plants and basins. So, excuse my apostrophe here, but these are the rose gallery of invasive grasses that we are dealing with, you know, currently in our stretch of the river. Um, guinea grass, buffalo grass, and giant reed. Buffalo grass is not typically a riparian invader, but it has established itself in our landscape, and it's there to stay without control. Um, giant reed is, is the one that I kind of have spearheaded and, and are working to control it. Um, Arunda, Arunda Donax, for those of you that don't know, and some of you are very familiar with this plant, highly invasive. Um, you know, host range or studies on, you know, microsatellite studies have suggested that this plant arrived in Texas or in Laredo, the Mediterranean, Spain. But considered one of the greatest threats, you know, to repairing areas, especially the Rio Grande Basin. Um, in the Cuatro Cienegas, they call it Ladrón del Agua. And, you know, it has many names, giant reed or rubber donax, whatever you want to call it. Detrimental changes to the landscape, decrease in biodiversity, high water usage. Um, this is something that we don't factor in, especially with the hydrology of these issues. But an invasive plant like this is very thirsty. It needs to sustain and maintain itself and grow. It needs water. So again, economic impact is huge. Um, border security, which, you know, they struggle with this plant is minus sight. And this is downriver of Amistad Dam and Eagle Pass, and you can see the swath of giant reed that has established itself along this area. So, familiarity with, you know, the four biological control agents that, you know, have been released in Texas, California, and I'm assuming New Mexico. Um, we are looking at the Arundo wasp, the true museum of Ron Romana, the Arundo scale, you know, Arundo fly, and Arundo leaf miner. The fourth in the leaf miner is currently, um, you know, back, back ordered, if you will, because of um, the inability to get it in mass rearing practice. So they're trying to get that controlled. Um, you know, certain things, or, or certain studies have shown that prescribed burning is largely ineffective. Chemical herbicides are effective, but after like seven applications, um, manual or mechanical removal does have some promising effects. And again, restoration after removal, what are we going to do? Is it going to be a passive or is it going to be an active type of restoration activity? Um, these are all questions that, you know, we think about whenever we're trying to restore these landscapes. And, you know, we often think about that there's no easy formula, no easy fix, and that everything is a case-by-case -case basis. The landscape in Laredo, Texas is very different from the Big Bend area, right? We have accessibility, it's relatively flat, it's gently rolling, so we have, you know, access or we can have access but to tractors and things like that to kind of remove it. So passive restoration and just mechanical removal, um, these are two pictures that illustrate um, the same plot in 2008 and 2009. You can see some, you know, the physical characteristic of the cane in this plot is significantly different, you know, lying next to each other. So, you know, what happened to it? Biomass decreased over time. And that is, you know, playing the weather on our side, right? This is summer, you know, lack of rainfall, it's very dry. So, you know, mechanical removal over time will cause decrease in biomass. This graph kind of illustrates the decrease in biomass, you know, from October you have stem diameter, you know, of comparable age and decreasing over time and it becomes very spindly. Again, consequences of vegetation removal without a restoration plan. This is huge. You know, go in here and you remove and you control and you're done. Right? What's next? What are we dealing with here? These are all the questions that we face whenever we start, you know, meeting, you know, control challenges of these plants.
um, erosion, sedimentation, and you know these are all things that could affect the landscape. And just very quickly moving forward, um, the new study that has been going on, you know, restoration plots were established along the Rio Grande, um, eight by eight meter plots, three replicates of each, one with giant reed, non-giant reed invaded, which is our control, giant reed invaded restored, giant reed invaded restored with one C type and uninvaded restored. So this is our little skid steer kind of cutting them down. Seed plots with sunflower. This is our seed mix of 20 different species that are found along the border. And this is our also bee traps that we set up to kind of look at how restoration of these areas affected native bee communities. This is unrestored aerial view. Seed plot in February, you know, cleared it, you know, removed all of the residue, planted our seed, and this was March 2017. And you can see some of the grasses coming back, some of the seeds that we planted, April 2017, and that is in May. So we have a transition with active restoration from giant reed, monotypic stand, to sunflowers, which are all resources for native, um, native insects, bees. April 2017, this is another mechanical plot. Here we have April 2018. Transition only using mechanical removal. Um, bee genera summary, and these are all the plots that we've established along the border, and all the bee genera that were you know, represented in this study. Um, interesting you know, findings. Um, walking up and down the river, you know, collecting samples, looking at plants have yielded you know, interesting finds that I have never encountered before. The Mexican croton, Rio Grande dewberry, which are unique plants that are found along the border, which obviously are at risk from invasion of giant breed. And lastly, green spaces protection, and this is one of those with you know, homeland security effects. We have an area close to the, you know, the city of Laredo, here's the Rio Grande, called Las Palmas Park. This was a park in 2016, this was a park in 2018. Department of Homeland Security came in here and said, we're going to control giant reed, we're going to bulldoze everything. And that means everything. Trees, grasses, everything. So it took it all down. Without any plan for reseeding, without erosion blankets, without anything to control the sedimentation, you know, any type of, you know, movement of that, of that soil. And this is another view from it. It's bare. And we started a pilot study where we told them, stop bulldozing, okay, and we are going to reseed these plots and see how the transition, you know, occurs over time. And again, river and national security. River is and will always be our number one asset. We must have smarter border protection, which conserves our river and our country's natural heritage moving forward. And I thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. Uh, as David said, my name is Pedro Ochoa. I have been working in the Natural Commission of Protected Area for the last 15 years. Uh, we manage uh, three of the four protected areas working in South Big Bend, that's our areas of Carmen, Ocampo, and Monumento Natural Rio Bravo del Norte. Uh, that last one protected area is uh, overlapping, I think, so maybe 100% with the well, the Rio Grande well, well and Scenic River. So that is a very important factor about the, the things that we are doing together. So the thing that I really need to uh, let you know that I, I really make that, I really wish to make that presentation in Spanish because uh, my English is not very fluent, but I am not a very fluent speaker, but I do my best to, uh, let, to pass the, the message to you. So, uh, the name of the presentation that you, you can see there is Community Participation and Restoration along the Rio Bravo. So, the session, the session uh, name refers habitat and flower, flower. But uh, I think so it's also important, uh, as Anna's presentation says, uh, shows uh, is to include the people, the people that are in that, in that picture. So, it's a very important thing already. So, um, 
Just for the people that uh, don't know uh, where exactly are that protected area, I, I didn't put a map, I'm sorry. But uh, we uh, are managing more or less from Paso Lajitas, uh, talking about the Monumento. Paso Lajitas uh, to almost the junction with the Peco River, I think so, it's that the distance that the, the decree has. But uh, we mostly focus over, over four of our job in the section uh, in between uh, the borderline between Chihuahua and Coahuila, on the line in the more or less is the most of the, the section that we work. So, as everyone knows here, the Rio Grande and Rio Bravo is more than the water line dividing a political boundary in the map. Between Mexico and USA has been an important list of agreements about a bunch of topics related with the river. Moreover, the use of water of the conservation of the habitat along the edge, the involvement of the stakeholders and public in an active conservation is a special challenge in Mexico, in Mexico side, at least when we are talking about rural communities. Uh, what can I say about the conservation initiatives from Mexico? Um, the scale at which different actors are involved in the conservation of the hydric resources is very often. Here you can see a couple of examples, um, like NGOs with specific types like fish or a particular region inside the watershed, CONAVA and IPWC, SILA, with the legal administration of the water. Uh, federal and state protected areas are another example. Uh, however, virtually, does not exist any local or community group focused and organized for itself to tackle directly such kind of topics. An exception could be Amigos del Rio San Rodrigo, a local NGO and a small NGO actually, who protect a specific tributary in Piedras Negras, a nearby uh, Paso region. Uh, so, because it's difficult to get involved with people, so to motivate the participation of the communities, the environmental education was taken as a flag. So, the first step that we made to get the people involved is what, obviously, clarify them the source of concern. Putting their mind information about the identified problem, we will be able to make the people more sensitive. First, you must promote a feeling in them. Fear, sadness, happiness, whatever you wish, whatever you want. Second, we'll need to provide enough information to make awareness in the people. And finally, once we, we cover those two steps, uh, it will be easy invite the people to take thinker or planning actions. I say, who is? Entonces, manos a la obra es el punto. Uh, in the case of the protected areas at the other side of the river, we use as a target topic the invasive species control. To face up such goal, the staff of the protected area first acquire a set of technical speech skills, which in some cases, like me, we didn't have before. So we need to fire and learn a lot about a lot of stunts, river stuff that we really don't, we, we don't grow with that experience. So number two, uh, we need to make sure about the really that we really understand the ecological implications of the invasive species control. If we don't know, we can pass the information. So and eventually be, and then eventually become the traders of another people's involvement. And be, added, and be adapted, or, I mean us, we need, we need to be adapted to repeat the training process as many times as possible, as needed, actually, almost as an iterative process. All the time we need to train new people, or the same people, and, and make new information. Uh, so, as a part of the training process, a list of the skills uh, that must be developed come to the scenario for us. So, one of the first and basic things we, we give to the people as information as a training was kind of important skills. Although many people uh, from the river communities already have a lot of experience paddling and swimming in the river, we need to be sure about the, about the way they use the canoes, for example, in order to enhance the project. Um, other topic, for example, was the security language and water rescue. So the risk that the river offers, as everybody here knows, the must at least a basic knowledge about how to face a hazard experience. So the real is also is dangerous sometimes. Uh, use of fire. This was another, to another topic in the list. A set of regulations and ecological considerations were analyzed for. 
Uh, we get a lot of help from uh, international parts to the uh, fire management office and, uh, and science and resource management. So they train the people uh, with the help of the Diablos and the fire management crew. And another, another topic, for example, was also the maintenance and operation of, the speed, of specific or uh, special equipment. So the success of the operation really depends on the adequate use and care of the equipment. Here, for example, we are we're taking care of learning about how to use the Bote de la Muerte, that boat we call it. So just for mention, there's some, some topics. So, once we took the pilot, everything looked like a bingo or lottery, lotería, I think, in Mexico, play. So, we have the cane, el carrizo. We have the salt cedar, tamarind. We have the river. We have monitoring. And we have partnership. So, bingo. <laughs> but it's a bueno. So, Oh, but it's important to let you know that uh, the four does not begin six, five or six years ago. So according with uh, protected our information, so the first project uh, any NGO or agency implement at the Mexico side of the river, of course, inside the Deep Bridge, let's say, uh, took place uh, more or less 20 years ago and was Boquillas, the community who implemented that first project. Also, I'm going to take advantage of that forum to let you know that Boquillas, yes, is part of the protected area. So, just for information. There's groups that feel threatened by any experiment of the sort, especially the, the farming side, which is very powerful uh, in, in Mexico. So, any, any move that we make in the sense that we need to consider their, their understanding, their feelings, and uh, make sure that they understand the benefits that they'll get from these uh, type of experiments. So I think uh, a few years ago we tried, we, we, we did, uh, I don't know if it's not you remember the, the River Day, which was an initiative that we uh, proposed through the Congress of the State of Chihuahua, whereby the Congress, uh, uh, unanimously, the Congress of that state invited Conagua to do an experimental release. It was a huge thing, and we were going to do a festival of what would be called the River Day. So everything was ready. Conagua had the technical arguments to open the dam and let the river flow on a particular day. And when the day arrived, basically the farmers tied themselves to trees underneath the, the cordon. And uh, at the time, the government of Chihuahua called us, uh, I was working for the WWF at the time, and they called us and said, how do we move? And I said, and we figured that it was best to let the, live, the river day alone for the, for the moment because the risk, you know, of, of the social risk of, of doing such an experiment did not uh, compensate uh, the benefits from such an experiment. So, yeah, my advice we need to be careful. We're ready for it, but we need to be careful and we need to take into consideration the needs, the understanding and the feelings of the other stakeholders before we pull an initiative uh, as such. Um, about a month ago, there was a conference in Las Cruces called Two Nations, One Water Conference. And at that um, meeting, uh, Dr. Gabriel Eckstein, I believe, um, and his point at the time was that informal cross-border agreements are probably more likely to get things done than um, at the state level, for instance. It doesn't mean things won't happen there. I'm just suggesting that um, the fact that there's discussions across between the NGOs, I think, is, is positive and we can use that to benefit not only the environment, but those ecosystem services, clean water, and all, all of the kind of things that, that we need to return. A lot of times we say preaching to the choir. You have the same NGOs, you have the same organizations in the room hearing and saying the same things. How do the locals in Mexico feel of Ojinaga, Mulato, Boquillas? What is their take or what is their overall feel towards the river or the quality of it, etc.? Actually, we are in the process of long process, but because, uh, as I say, uh, there are although there are some NGOs like WWF, Natura, and other ones that are participating in the process of education and also implementation of the projects for restoration and conservation monitoring, etc. So the people are being primarily involved as, uh, as workers. 
so talking about the people from communities and then so most uh, or most of the you know um, employees from the government like need so uh, we are just running to the process to complete some projects sometimes so the really challenge is uh, jump to only you know reach a project or prior to project to move for uh, a paradigm as soon as somebody says, say that the word paradigm to change the mind of the people so, so the people already have have moved their mind to, to the because information I said there are a lot of information available in the, in, in the, in the network for example so but the people is, uh, is taking that information as something new although there is I don't know 20, 13 or more, maybe more years that information available so they are working in it. Actually, we have we have um, groups of environmental promoters, uh, mostly women, and, uh, and they are. We are trying to put in their minds some information on different topics, not only the river, not only the water, but I don't know, waste management, monitoring the wildlife, etc. So that uh, is like a generational, a generational uh, process that we are more or less in. Uh, after 20 years of uh, management, I, I'm talking about the protected area, we have maybe the second or the third generation of people who is thinking a little bit different. So but we have another, another kind of, you know, um, uh, items or sources of concern that the people are um, actually political things that are moving. Uh, uh, one thing is, so the people from the rural communities, for example, they north of Ocampo, so they are, they are living in the, the communities, so it, because they are looking for a best way of living, uh, uh, we understand that, but uh, I think it's also an opportunity to go to the cities for them and, uh, and take more, more uh, you know, knowledge to, that they can apply them when they come back, because we wish they come back for the, for the lands. So in that process, in that uh, in time frame, uh, so the education must to be the, the you know like uh, the ingredient to move the uh, the, pers the perspective for a best uh, focus actually. But actually there is moving. I don't know if we have a quantity. We don't have a scale, you know, number scale, quantitative to say oh we are here and I'm now here. But actually uh, uh, we are as a, as a um, federal agency we are. Uh, Promoting uh, the formation, you know, the, the, the build of uh, different kind of uh, figures, you know, like uh, NGOs, local NGOs, because they are more empowering about the, about their resources. Because uh, it's not the job; that it, it's, it's not bad, absolutely. So the but the, 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 the basic, you know, the the, the, the base actually, the base of the development was a lot. The NGOs are in Mexico, the the, the medium and. and and big NGOs, but that little step not must to be not uh, thinking in the government that, that the government can give you everything. So maybe that step must to be in the opposite way, moving for the little things, the little things. I don't know if that is an answer for you. Okay, thank you. For me, also. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Bring a few issues for our forward also. I think uh, I think we made a great progress in this, and we do need to say that who are we talking about? You know, the views from urban communities versus rural communities are very different. Uh, farming communities versus uh, uh, your average you know, citizen in Monterrey are very different. So I think overall uh, awareness of the problem is, is very high. People are aware of the problems, the environmental problems that we're having. People are aware of the river, they are aware that the river is suffering. Um, but there's a lot of misinformation or lack of information regarding the facts and the things that can be done, uh, the things that cannot be done, and who is to blame and are in this for, 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 for the things that happen. So uh, we've learned we're missioning, uh, we've launched a few uh, social media campaigns, very strong, we're reaching millions of people. And we're getting millions of comments from both from people supporting and haters that gives a lot of provides a lot of information and, and retro on, on, on what people believe in. 
So, uh, it's in that one of the, of the things that we focus on, we've heard, is that people tend to blame someone for the problems. And that someone, they're blaming, is usually not the person or the entity to, blame, to, to be blamed for. So it's very easy to blame the beer, the factory, the refresco, uh, the, the soda, the, the industry, etc. When agriculture is using 75 to 80 percent of the water that's been uh, extracted from, from the system, between 70 and 75 percent overall, and 93 to 95 percent from the concentration, it is being used by farmers. Now, farming it's, 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 it's a very light and a very appreciated activity. We all eat, so so. We cannot go out and blame farmers for, for, the, for the catastrophe. We just need to figure out uh, new ways. To how do we how do we save water and, and give that water back to the environment? So when we come out with these campaigns and tell people, well, in fact, the industry actually uses 20 percent of the water. Uh, agriculture is the other 70 percent, and, uh, and, and and people, your average citizen, uses only 10 percent. We get cursed that. People don't like that idea. So we need to figure out ways to bring out those facts so we can you know, take that awareness that's already there and re educate it and retarget it towards uh, putting pressure to the right person, to the one, to the decision making, to the, to the key uh, gatekeeper that actually needs to be uh, convinced and, 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 and change and, and, and the guy that's going to actually make a decision and make the change. So, so, so awareness is there. But there's a lot of misinformation, and so that that we need to educate uh, the people. Yeah, that's a that's a good segue actually into the into the next question that was provided by the audience. And the question goes: Can water markets in Texas be used to protect or enhance environmental flows? So if the panel wants to talk about water markets, maybe that's a focus on Ryan, maybe or others. I'll I'll say there's other folks in the room that can, can probably give a much better answer on this, and maybe can can speak to this um, in discussions and, maybe, and tomorrow also, but in theory, definitely yes. I mean, there, there are places that um, the, the gap between what, what the river needs and what can be accomplished through, um, you know, through voluntary transfer of water rights or lease or even, even the amendment of existing water rights for its use. I mean, there, there are places where theoretically that, that could that could bridge the gap. You know, the problem gets into what <laughs> what Jeff alluded to, which is um, there are there are certain characteristics that need to be put, to be in place as far as enabling conditions for the market or for any other transaction based um, strategy or mechanism. And that's more of a challenge is finding um, you know, putting putting those things together with the right enabling conditions in the right the right places. And there, I mean, we're talking about a basin where there's there is one place where where those conditions have come together to some degree, and that is you know in the supply system for the lower the lower Rio Grande, which you know, theoretically could could be a place where um, where we think about how to apply these mechanisms for some environmental benefit. Um, but I would say the rubber is a long way from being the road on that. Is that is that fair, Kyle? <laughs> uh, yes, I've got a, a question on some of the ongoing restoration efforts, and uh, I'm thinking that 20 years ago the emphasis would have been here on on the uh, Tamarisk, uh, doing a lot of work on that, and today I see it's a room uh, I'm wondering uh, where are we on those?
so there was no food need, so the will be have um, diminished quite a bit. And now if you drive, I heard the other day, if you drive the river road, you'll see quite a bit of salt seal coming up. Um, I expect the beetle's still out there somewhere, and it will eventually start to reproduce in higher numbers, and it will push it back. And then that's how the program is intended to work. That's how biocontrols work. Um, so um, the biological controls for the Arundo, if, if we get those sex established, that will also be the case. The, the Arundo will fade and not be so dominant. Some information about that uh, control the force in Mexico. So, I'm talking about some similar uh, wind work, maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 years continuously with a uh, basic chemical treatment. When, but when uh, bill comes, actually, they help us a lot. Uh, uh, I'm talking about technically there in the field, so when, when they when the bill comes, we reduce almost the double the time to beat. Uh, you know, the, 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 we, we spend maybe one year to beat a stand of cameras, we spend actually just you know, the half of the time when the bill comes. But uh, was also a debate with the rural communities there actually again, then Mexico, because they use as a resource, a different resource, so, so in the case of the cameras, they, they know we're very happy about the, the beetles' presence because they, you know, eat from the shade trees that they use. So, uh, along the time, actually, uh, so the density of that insect is, are not, are moving a lot, actually, I'm not an expert about, an expert about it, but uh, they are moving in their dynamic population. Uh, so, that's about the tamarix. So, I'm talking about the tamarix ramosissima, so that species reduce for us more or less 80% or something in, in the section we use, more or less. And, uh, and AFO is a other story. <laughs> Actually, we are, we are still trying to, to, to beat that species that we don't see as a very hazard stuff, but we only need any way to move, to move from, far away from the, from the river. And uh, uh, that's the thing with the tamarisk the tamarisk down, you know, in our stretch in Webb County isn't really a big problem. Um, we do have aethyl along, you know, the river's edge, but around the system, up, I think the salt cedar, what we call salt cedar, the low-growing shrub, is present in our creeks, you know, and arroyos down there. Um, currently, there's no program to, you know, for removal, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of other invaders, you know, Vitex or Chastity Bush is pretty much going to take over the area. You know, within the next couple of years, um, you know, a lot of the invasive grasses, any grass, for sure. Um, and, of course, giant reed is one of the big problems that we have. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, just, I just noted that, like I say, 20 years ago, the, the big demon on the river was salt cedar. And uh, I am still, I live on the banks of the river creek, I'm still seeing the uh, occasional trees in the big Although not this year, but last year I definitely saw some. So, uh, it, I was just curious if we had completely abandoned that project. It sounds like we may have. Melissa and Ola, WBF. So, first of all, thank you so much for the informative presentations and really for all the work on the ground that you do for the river. Um, and I appreciate very much the partnership between the countries and the conservation groups in this space. I'm curious, you've noted um, a lot of the challenges um, and that it, it's difficult to get the message across on the conservation importance. And so thinking ahead on that, compromises are going to need to be made in terms of there's not enough water potentially to meet all the needs. Um, is there consensus in the conservation community and then between the groups in the U.S. but as well as the groups in Mexico? Um, what are the biggest issues and constraints? What are the highest priorities? And what you, you know, would build to, to do to address those things? There's, there's a lot of things that have been brought up, and I'm just wondering, as the conservation arm of this discussion, what are your priorities and what are you willing to actually compromise on? <laughs> I'll 
how you take it. <laughs> uh, first thing that comes to mind is yes, there is because we've been working for a long time, and I think we have, we agree on most of at least on what should be done and what needs to be done. Again, it's based on science, and science is very objective, and uh, it's very difficult to review something. You know, once we went through the science scientific method and showed that the river needs X or Y uh, to move. Now, the, how that's where, where differences may, may, may come in. And I think these flows will be, uh, I mean, I understand agreement that if we establish, first of all, the, 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 the goal of the flows, because I mean, if you're going to do e flows, you need to do them for some for, for a particular reason. So there's a vision that was developed in 2000, uh, 2008. Uh, we had a, a workshop similar to these, to this one here, and we all came out with, with a very broad vision, uh, and it's, it's very rhetorical and poetic, but, but I think it, it helps and it works on how we want to see, uh, we would, how we would like to see the river in the future. So I think that, that most of the work that, that, that entities on both sides of the border have been focused on, at least NGOs, uh, is related to that vision that we developed at the time. That it may be a good, maybe, maybe we need to review it, but it at least gave us a, a benchmark or a, a starting point to see where we were heading. So, at, at least from uh, the perspective of the Natura and, and, and a lot of our partners in Mexico, uh, we agreed on that vision and we are exploring the legal instruments, the policies, and, and, and the opportunities uh, on the Mexican side of, of, of the river where we, uh, on what we can do. Uh, again, take into consideration all the stakeholders, all the needs, all the, all the risks. Uh, but how can we use what we have to get as close as we can to that particular vision? Um, it's long been the, the position of the eFlows community, and that's a financial community, mostly on the U.S. side, that what we've uh, been asking for is that the waters that are governed by the treaty get managed in such a way that there's some environmental benefit. We're not asking for more water. No one's ever asked for additional water on top of the 350,000 acre feet that the treaty says gets delivered. Um, we're not asking that, that the treaty get rewritten or, or that their minutes change any of that. We're just asking that water deliveries get made in such a way that there's some environmental performance, some environmental benefit. Um, and, and that's just a matter of how fast you turn it on and how fast you turn it off. And, and the other thing I would say to that is the, the first presentation that I did for Amy made the point that our protected areas, you know, that's something that's done in both countries, and we do that because we understand the benefit of that, that there's ecosystem services, clean air, clean water, all sorts, all sorts of things that come from those protected areas. But the waters, underlying water sources are not protected, and that's something I think that we need to address both groundwater and surface water. 